Well, welcome to City First Church. We are so glad that you are here. Shout out to everyone joining us from Cape, the State Line area online and here at Spring Creek. And especially want to give a warm welcome to everyone joining us from God Behind Bars. Come on, can we make some noise for everyone from God Behind Bars? Uh, before we jump into today's message, I just want to give a big shout out to Champions Club on this Superhero Sunday. Uh, not every church has a ministry for families with special needs, but City First Church does. And we are so grateful to have a dedicated space in the building for your families because we believe they are special to God. So for every Champions Club family and volunteer, we salute you today. Uh, we're also continuing 21 days of prayer here at City First Church. And while we're seven days in, it's not too late for you to join us for the next 14. Um, and here's what that looks like and how you can join in. First thing we want you to do is download the app where you can find daily prayer focuses there and you can sign up for daily emails if technology really intimidates you. I'm sure someone can be kind enough in your family to help you figure that out. Number two, we want you to follow along on social media media, Instagram, and Facebook is where we're going to be posting some of those daily prayers and focuses. And number three, you could always visit the website at cityfirst.church slash 21 days of prayer. Uh, I get the honor and privilege of continuing a series we started last week that we've entitled How to Be a Superhero. A superhero we defined last week as simply anyone who looks around the world they live in and decides to take action to make a difference. And I think each and every one of us was put on the planet to make a difference. And I think one of the ways that you and I can make a difference in the world that we live in is by living a lifestyle of generosity. Uh, one of the main takeaways from last week was simply this. If you want to live like no one lives, give like no one gives. If you want to live like no one lives, give like no one gives. If you want a story to tell, be the biggest giver in the room. Uh, this week, I want to look at uh, two uh, sets of scripture, and I'm calling uh, this two super hero challenges. Okay, these are superhero generosity challenges, and both things that I'm going to ask us to do today are very hard. Very, very hard, but they come from Scripture. And I can tell you this, while they're superhero challenges, they're not my ideas, okay? One of them is from Jesus, and another one of them is from the Apostle Paul. And this is the one that we see from Jesus. Luke 6, verse 30. Give to everyone who asks you. Give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Now, right away, you might be booing on the inside of your heart, okay? Give to everyone that asks you. There has to be a typo in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus must be kidding. There's no way he meant everyone. I mean, surely he meant to say, give to everyone you discern has good intentions, who will do godly things with the money. I mean, like, like surely he meant like, you know, like give to everyone that you like. Like, what in the world do we do with this scripture? Oh, like, like if you're like me, I'm praying that there's a Greek meaning of the words here that sort of get us out of this because if Jesus is serious about giving to everyone, then we would be in for a colossal change in how we live our lives. Now, I want you to just indulge me for just a few moments. What if we actually tried to do this? Now, if you're looking at this verse, and you're thinking, this is bananas. Well, I agree with you. This is bananas. But so is everything Jesus said right before this verse and everything he said right after this verse. Let's take a look. Luke 6, 27 says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. 
Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Then there's verse 31 that says, do to others as you would have them do to you. We love to quote that one. But we don't quote the verse before. It says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Verse 33 says, and if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? I mean, Jesus is going on. He says, even sinners do that. And even if you lend from those whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High because he is kind to to the ungrateful and wicked. In case you missed the list of the lifestyle Jesus called his followers to, I've compiled the list for you. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. If someone steals your laptop, let them keep it. Lend to your enemies without expecting them to pay you back. This has to be the craziest list of behaviors I've ever heard of. And you have to ask yourself, how well have you done with this list? I mean, when Jesus speaks about turning the other cheek, he's talking about being passive in the face of a physical attack. Culturally speaking, a slap on the cheek was more of an attack on honor than a physical assault. In the face of an offense, Jesus isn't discouraging defense, but he's discouraging retaliation. Because when someone insults us, our gut reaction is to do what? Retaliate. I mean, when I'm looking at this list, (laughs) honestly, adding giving to everyone who asks of you, to the list is a little easier than letting someone slap you in the face a second time, especially an enemy. I mean, we're talking about the people that you don't like and they don't like you. Jesus is like, yeah, I want you to help them. And then all of a sudden we throw in give to everyone. I'm like, well, you know what? I'd rather give to everyone than to, man, have to treat my enemy so well. But guess what's included in everyone? The people you love and the people you don't. It's radical on purpose, ladies and gentlemen. Following Jesus is not something that is comfortable. He wants his followers to display a kind of love most humans would never go to the extent to live out in the first place. He wanted to give his followers examples of what crazy love would look like. So the recipients of that love would know only a God could inspire someone to live with that kind of love, with that kind of generosity. Because who's good at loving their enemies? You know anybody who's good at that? Who's, who's good at praying for those who mistreat them? Somebody's getting bullied and, and all that. You're like, let me pray for that person. Who does that? Christ followers. It's not generosity until you're going the extra mile and doing the extraordinary. So should we give to everyone who asks? I certainly think we should at least try. I don't believe we should give to everyone whatever they ask of us. Because people are often better at requesting what they want more than what they need. My standard of living is I try to think, give them something. Some of us won't even respond to a person. We won't even give them the time of day. Give them something. It doesn't always have to be money. Some people need our time. Someone may ask for money for what they, but may ask for money, but what, what they really need is some advice, maybe a listening ear. I don't think we should just blindly give people money. 
Most people's request for money comes with what they'd like the money for. It's for a bill. It's for a need. It's for food. So what would it look like for us to then, I don't know, go get them some food? I mean, I had this deal where when I, I was first introduced to giving to the poor or giving to someone on the side of the road, somebody's got a sign, it's just like, okay, how, what, what do, how, how do we sort of, sort of handle this? And, and I started getting in this habit of, of seeing a guy on the side of the road and I would just go, oh, I don't have cash. I don't have cash. Uh, sorry, can't help you. And then uh, I started hearing this theory that, hey, we don't give poor people money because they're going to go spend it on drugs and alcohol. So just don't, just don't, just don't, don't do anything. I'm like, but his sign says food. Yeah, but he's lying. So like, okay. And so I, I, I let, I let that be for a while until I read Luke 6.30. So there's this guy um, that would be uh, at the corner close, close to my house and he, like he has set up shop. He's there every day and I ignored him for years until I read Luke 6.30 and really let it sit in. And one day with no cash, I rolled down the window and I said, hey, you hungry? He said, so my sign says, like, I'm not joking about that. I'm like, okay, there's a Burger King kitty corner from where he stands. I said, what you want, man? What you want from Burger King? He was like, it's amazing how even a person that's homeless knows their order from Burger King. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're like, man, let me get a number four with the, I'm like, oh, this man knows, this man knows the menu, okay? He's like, all right, man, number four, with Dr. Pepper. I said, all right, man, I got you. So I drive over, Burger King, get him a number four with a Dr. Pepper, and I bring it back to him. He said, man, I, I, I really appreciate you. And I went, I'm a really good Christian today. I feel really great about this decision. That, that was, that, you know what, that, that, was, that was great. Next day I'm driving, I see him again. And I went, Luke 6.30 is messing up my life. Roll down the window. Hey man, you hungry? Sign says I'm hungry. I'm like, he had Burger King yesterday and he's an American so he probably doesn't want that again. Popeyes. Hey, man, you want anything from Popeyes? He's like, yeah, I'll take a number three with a Dr. Pepper. I go, you really like Dr. Pepper. Okay, so, and I'm just going, this dude is, he's not just being an inconvenience on my wallet. Now he's being an inconvenience on my time. Heaven forbid we be late for something like that. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ should inconvenience our schedule every now and then. Think about it like this. I want you to think about the reasons that you and I have been late for anything in our lifetime. The snooze button. Ah, just some, oh, my, my, my bed, I'm late. Number two, traffic. Wardrobe malfunction. If we're honest, just poor time management. Makeup catastrophe. Speeding. You got pulled over. Uh, not filling up for gas. Netflix. My kids pooped around. Like, we have so many reasons why we've been late in our life. But can you imagine if you walked in late for work, late for school, and for the first time in your life, you told your boss, you told your teacher, you told the principal, hey, I'm late because I went out of my way to get breakfast for somebody that couldn't eat. What a way to live. Dare I say, a super way to live. I hope I'm late more often. For amazing reasons. You know what I figured out with this guy? He was hungry. And I'm like, man, I, I can't be, go I, I, I don't know how I'm going to keep this up. So you know what I did? Next time I went grocery shopping, I bought cereal bars. And I keep them in the glove box for anybody that's hungry. You're going, well, Ryan, that's, that, that ain't the same as a hot meal from BK. I know. But it's far from, he's a drug addict. Right. Yep. He's an alcoholic. I'm not going to help anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I would rather walk around with snacks in my car because the gospel is moving me outside of my comfort zone to think about other yeah. people. My prayer for each and every person watching this message 
is that your schedule would be inconvenienced in the best way possible. Ultimately, when someone makes a request of us, I think our heart should be, how can I make this happen instead of how can I get out of it? Could you imagine what our lives would look like if we actually took Jesus' advice on how to live generously? I'll say this again. If you want to live like no one lives, you have to learn to give like no one gives. So, the superhero challenge number one, give to everyone who asks of you. And when in doubt, err on the side of generosity. Don't shoot the messenger. Jesus said it. I didn't. And in case you want to get out of this one, read the verses before and after it. And you pick the one that you go, okay, okay. I'm pretty sure we'll settle on this one. The second superhero challenge comes from the Apostle Paul, who issued a literal generosity challenge in his letter to the early church in Corinth. Here's what he wrote in the eighth chapter of that letter. He says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through churches in Macedonia. Remember, he's writing a church to the he's writing a letter to the church in Corinth, and he's saying, "Hey, I want you to know what's happening at the church in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles, and they are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy, which has overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more, and they did it out of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They even did more than we had hoped for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. So we have urged Titus, who encouraged your giving in the first place, to return to you and encourage you to finish this ministry of giving. Since you excel in so many ways, in your faith, in your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love from us, I want you to excel also in the gracious act of giving. Paul gave an example to the church of Corinth about a group of Christ followers in another region who were not rich, but they were very generous. Essentially, Paul is looking at the church of Corinth and saying, surely you're not going to let the church of Macedonia outgive you, right? He then encouraged them to excel in the act of giving. The superhero challenge number two is to excel in your level of giving. Wherever you are, excel. How do you excel in giving? The first thing is this. Identify where you are. Identify where you are. You must first analyze where you are in terms of giving and generosity. Are you giving anywhere? To church? To people? Some would honestly just say, they don't give at all. Well, then you identify that you are at zero and you need to excel And you're giving. The second thing that I think is very important if you're going to excel in giving is determine where you want to go. Determine where you want to go. You need a measuring stick to understand what next level slash superhero giving and generosity looks like for you. As we're about to learn, next level giving and generosity doesn't always equal giving more money. But if you want to excel in this area of your life, you need to have a goal. Maybe you want to be a generosity rock star. And at City First, that simply means giving 20 bucks a week. Maybe you want to start tithing and giving God the first 10% of your income. Maybe you heard the story I shared last week about a friend who gives 91% of their income away. And you say, you know what? That's my goal. Whatever it is, you have to make a goal and write it down. For my mom, she wrote a goal down that her and my father, she, they had a rule. Anytime there is an opportunity to give, an offering at any church, any service of any kind, doesn't matter if it's multiple service, they always give. 
I, I can't tell you how many times I was sitting next to my mother at a church somewhere in Illinois, traveling with my dad, whatever. My mom would reach in her purse and hand me a quarter and say, don't let the plate go by without giving something. Just, again, their goal wasn't a specific number. It was, we don't let the plate go by without giving something. And, and I know we don't always do plates. It's digital. Things have changed. But every opportunity you have to say, you know what? If I have an opportunity, I'll give something. Whatever it is your goal is, you have to make a goal and write it down. Determine where you want to go. The third thing that's important is put a strategy in place to go there. Put a strategy in place to go to the next level. Desire without a plan is just a dream. Nobody achieves greatness on accident. If you want to excel in giving, it's going to be because you made a plan to do so. Now, the next part of this message is a little bit different, but I hope it gives us all a little bit of a measuring stick. And you may have your own for how you measure generosity, but I've found this one to be most helpful, and it comes from an ancient Jewish tradition. Uh, the reason I've adhered to it more than others is because Jesus was, well, Jewish, and often used uh, parables, illustrations, and idioms that a Jewish audience would understand. Uh, for example, if we were to look at Matthew 6, verse 22 through 23, it says the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? On the surface level, the words Jesus, uh, the, the words that Jesus is using would appear rather mysterious. How does one know if he has a bad eye or a good eye? But understanding the word eye within its Hebraic context gives us insight into Jesus's illustration. The idea of having a good eye with having a bad eye were two idioms that would have been a part of the Hebrew language from biblical times until today. So having a good eye is to look out for the needs of others and to be generous and giving to the poor. To have a bad eye is to be greedy and self-centered, blind to the needs of those around. It makes sense when you think about it. Bad eyes can't see. And when you can't see, you actually can't see other people. Good eyes, I can see. I've got great vision. And seeing well enough that you can see the needs of others because you're actually looking for them. So there were lots of hidden meanings in the, in the traditions of Jesus. And there was, there's this old Jewish tradition and they would call it eight levels of generosity. They literally measured generosity. And I'm going to go through those eight levels for us as we close out this message. And I want you to think about where, where do I fall in terms of my generosity? What level would I find myself on? And then spoiler alert, I just want you to go to the next level. Whatever level you find yourself, I just want you to go to the next level. Level one is when one gives unwillingly and grudgingly. This is this, is this kind of giving. All right, whatever, man. I'll give it to you. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, fine. Take it. Just take it. This is, this is what I like to call guilty giving. Okay, you, you gave because you were pressured to. But hey, at least you're giving something. It's better than level zero, okay, where, where one gives Zero. Okay. Uh, level two is interesting. It's when one gives inadequately, but gives gladly with a smile. Like I didn't give enough, but I gave you something and I'm in a good mood about it. Scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver. This is where you're giving with joy, but you don't have that much to give. Um, the, the biggest jump from level one to level two isn't necessarily in the amount given, but the heart change. This is where you go from being unwilling to give to being willing to give. Level three is interesting. When one gives to a person in need after being asked. So uh, this is where you respond generously to a person who has made a request of you. But the key at this level is that you had to be asked. I, I see this often um, whenever a family loses a loved one. The common mantra is uh, that we use toward each other was, you know, especially I had so many friends that just 
lost loved ones through COVID and, and for other reasons as well. And I would constantly hear this mantra, and I, I constantly heard myself telling this to other people. Let me know if you need anything. Hey, man, hey, guys, let me know if you need anything. If you need anything, man, we, we'd, be, we'd be happy to help, man. Just, just let me know if you need anything. They just lost their dad. They just lost their mom, their sibling, their loved one. Who in their moment of despair has the wherewithal to say, well, I could use, really use some help with some, with some funeral costs and some flights and some food. Like, who's, who's going to, the family's financial situation you, usually has to come through back channels. And once we're aware of the need and request, we then respond. But imagine if we started living at this next level, which this next level is level four is when one gives to the person in need directly into their hand, but gives before being asked. So this is next level giving because this is just going, you got to need, you know what I need? You know, you know what I know you need in a time of trouble? Money. You know what I know that you need in a time of trouble? Encouragement. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say you let me know what you need. I know what I would need if I was in your situation. So they may not need the money, but do they have someone in their family who is trying to scrape money together to get to the funeral while mourning their loved one at the same time? Now, here's the deal. I wish we, we lived in a world where all of us just had an emergency fund. But even for those who do have one, there are often emergencies that cost us more than what we've saved. Level five is this. When the recipient knows who the giver is, the recipient knows who the giver is. This is where the recipient is aware of the source of the generosity. But the giver does not know to whom the gift is is being given. So um, great scholars and sages of the ages, they actually used to tie coins into their robes and throw them behind their backs. And the poor would come up and pick the coins out of their robes. So the, the children or the poor would know who the giver was. They would know the source, but, but the actual sage, that scholar, was unaware of who got it. They, they, they were clueless. They, they didn't know who was taking it because they were just walking. They were just living in generosity and someone behind them could take it. But hey, I don't actually need to know who it is because if I know who it is, isn't there a little something in that for me? To go, yeah, I gave you something. No, I don't even want to know. Just give. Uh, my wife and I had a, uh, a young lady at our church approach us and simply said, hey, uh, we were blessed with a new SUV and my parents... Uh, were kind enough to get me a new car. And so, hey, I've got this, this uh, used Toyota Camry. It's in great shape. And um, I don't know anybody in my life who needs a vehicle, but I'm sure you do. You're at the church. And so you just, you just give it to whoever you want. And here's what's, what's so interesting. She says, I don't want to know who the recipient is. I just want to give. She literally handed us the keys and title and literally went out of town and just said, hey, I just want to be, somebody bless me. I just want to be a blessing to somebody else. I mean, what she did, her actions were level five generosity personified. Up level six is when one knows the recipient of the giving, but the recipient is unaware of the giver. Uh, sages who wanted to, to go to their next level of generosity were said to walk about in secret and put coins in the doors of the poor. They would just put, nobody needs to know. Um, this is where you buy lunch for a family across the restaurant. Uh, you would tell your waiter or waitress to put their meals on your bill and leave before they do. Um, you're aware of who is on the receiving end of your generosity, but you don't need to get any glory out of it. You still get the joy from it, yeah, take some of that joy home with the leftovers of going, I want to make the world a better place. Now, sometimes when me and my wife are just sitting in a restaurant, we'll just look for people that look like they can't afford to be there. We'll look for people that are just, they, they just look like, I don't know if they are, just, it's on us. The next time you're in a drive through order, getting coffee, chicken nuggets, Chick-fil-A, it's on Sunday, so tomorrow, pay for the person behind you. And then drive off as fast as you can and as safe as you can before they get your license plate number. Yeah. I mean, just imagine if, 
You just leveled up your giving and say, you know what? I want to give more and, and get no glory for it. Level seven, anonymous giving and receiving. This is where the giver doesn't know who's receiving the gift and where the recipient doesn't know who gave the gift. Um, in December of 2018, there were anonymous givers who really uh, were getting in the holiday spirit by paying off tens of thousands of strangers' layaway items at Walmarts all across the country. I mean, they would literally walk in Walmart. And for those of you who don't know what layaway is, it's, uh, it's a program where retailers allow customers to put items on hold and pay off their bill over time. They literally hold the items at the front. And once all the items in their layaway are paid for in full, shoppers can come and take that merchandise home. I grew up putting stuff on layaway all the time. Okay, I, had, I, I probably still got some, some Nikes at, at finish line right now, okay, that, that are just waiting for me to come get them. Now, uh, once they, they would take them home, uh, they, they, were, those, they were paid in full. And so literally people were going around to these Walmarts and going, hey, we want to take care of people's layaway. And in one Colorado Walmart, dozens of people were shocked when they discovered an anonymous person had paid for their entire layaway section at a particular Walmart, totaling about $44,000. Wow. Can you imagine if during your next trip to Walmart, you stopped by the customer service department and just asked if there was one item you could afford to pay off for someone else. Just imagine that. Again, we're thinking about the story that we want to tell. I mean, this is why I love giving to church. Because giving to church um, is, is, is similar to this mode of generosity. Um, and this, this is levels of giving. And this one is best for our ego because we're removing our pride from the generous transaction. At this level, we're not giving to look good or feel good. We're giving to do good. That's why I love giving to the local church. Because I get to support a large amount of good around the world. And I get no credit for it. I think in a perfect world, you and I all would take a day off work at least once a month and go feed the poor. In a perfect world. And as awesome as that would be, isn't there something in our ego about that, if we're honest? And when we give to God through the church, it's our greatest opportunity to make sure generosity isn't about us. I love what Matthew chapter six, verse three says. It says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret reward you. Imagine if we live like that. Imagine if you gave so much in your lifetime, you couldn't even remember all the generosity you'd been part of. You didn't even, there's nothing in this for me. I can't even tell what my right hand is doing from my left. Level eight, final level of generosity. It's when one supports another by endowing them with a gift or loan or entering into a partnership with them or finding employment for him in order to strengthen their hands so they will not need to be dependent upon others. The saying goes, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. I don't know who said it, but it was somebody awesome. The highest level of generosity is where you strengthen someone else's hand and put them in a position to be generous themselves. Let me help you level up. A greater gift to someone than money is equipping them with the tools to generate it for themselves. Most people work to have a good job, but imagine if you woke up every day looking for ways to create jobs. I love how the Apostle Paul concluded his generosity challenge. He says, give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. Of course, I don't mean your giving should make life easy for others and hard for yourselves. I only mean that there should be some equality. Right now, you have plenty and can help those who are in need. Later, they will have plenty and can share with you when you need it. In this way, things will be equal. So, Superhero challenge number one, give to everyone who asks of you and when in doubt, err on the side of generosity. What if Jesus isn't joking? Wouldn't just that one verse change our life? And superhero challenge number two, excel in your level of giving. 
the Apostle Paul is going, man, whatever, whatever level you find yourself at, whatever proportion that you have, give accordingly. Give, you're not going to let the church of Macedonia out give you, right? And if you're in a position to help somebody, do it. Because there could come a day where you're not in a position to do that. And prayerfully, somebody would come alongside you and help you. Wherever you find yourself on the levels of generosity, take it up a notch. Why? Because isn't that the story we all want to tell? Imagine if we were at level eight generosity people. We'd be superheroes. We could change whole communities. We could change whole generations for families. To say, how can I strengthen your hand? How can I help you with, to have some skills, some soft skills that could help you even get a promotion? What could I do to invest in someone else? I'd also challenge you to put these principles into practice by making a daily practice and asking God how you can be generous on a daily basis. Lord, help me be a giver. Lord, help me be a giver. Doesn't matter what your age is. Doesn't matter what your job is. Doesn't matter what your income is. I believe when a person makes a decision to be generous, God resources that person. A person that wakes up every single day and says, God, I want to meet needs. God, I want to meet needs. Whose heart is pure in that? Say, God, I want to meet needs. God, I want to meet needs. I believe God will put you in a position to meet needs. And I think you will find yourself having superhero type stories. If you want to live like no one lives, give like no one gives. God, I thank you so much for City First Church. I pray, God, that you would help us live like no one lives and that you would put us in a position to give like nobody gives. Lord, may you put people in our path who absolutely need to hear about you. And may they hear about you, perhaps through some of our generosity. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody said. If you're here today and uh, you've never made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I can't think of a better decision than surrendering your life to Jesus. To so say, you know what, perhaps, perhaps you, you don't feel like you're a generous person, you're not a giving person. Maybe, maybe some things happen in your life where somebody took something from you and you feel like, man, I, don't, I just don't have a whole lot to give. I think today could change your life. I think today could be a day where you start a whole new direction for your family. And I believe making that decision, maybe for you, it's rededicating your life to Christ. Can we all just say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender my future and my path to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to Christ?